So welcome to uh, UW Grand Rounds. Hello to everyone who's watching from afar. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ed Lean or Lean? Lean, uh, who is uh, visiting us from the Allen Brain Institute. He's an investigator there and uh, director of their human cell type program. He had actually been with the Allen Institute from the inception of the mouse brain atlas and had more recently been leading a consortium group to create a transcriptional uh, atlas of the developing human brain. So gene expression map in the context of brain circuits and uh, regions and time. So super cool and relevant stuff. Um, he did his undergraduate degree at Purdue where I learned that you were already working on brain atlases. <laughs> And then uh, did his uh, PhD and postdoc at Berkeley with Dr. Carla Schatz, investigating uh, neuronal biology in the vision system, and then uh, went down to San Diego at the Salk Institute until he was recruited back up here to the Allen Institute to uh, work on the brain mapping, and like I said, more recently on the human brain uh, expression mapping, which is, of course, very relevant to us. So as we know, uh, many neurological and most neurodegenerative diseases are uniquely human. Um, our dementing illnesses, psychiatric disease, our complexity of thought are all uniquely human and somewhere in the black box. And so uh, Dr. Lean has jumped into that black box and is working to um, understand what is it that makes a cerebellar neuron a cerebellar neuron, about why a cortical neuron is a cortical neuron, and what leads to their selective vulnerability to the same injury. And uh, these are the types of questions that underlie our understanding of human disease. So really important for us to know. And, and on a practical note, um, you know, we all know that the lack of success in uh, animal trials of human disease, translating that to human therapeutics, has been, has been woefully unsuccessful, but probably in part to these unique molecular features and circuits that, um, that we have to humans. That, so, we look forward to learning more. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation and for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so what I'd like to do in this talk is, is to really sort of uh, explore a little bit with you um, my desire to try to understand what might be sort of unique about the human cortex uh, compared to model organisms. Uh, for the last decade or so, uh, I've really been engaged in the primary endeavors of the Allen Institute, which have been to try to create atlases of the developing human, non-human primate, and mouse brain. Uh, this began about 10 years ago uh, when we uh, started out by trying to create a comprehensive map of all transcripts in the mouse brain. And this really sort of blossomed over the years as we moved on to try to capture more and more from just sort of transcript level to more complex transcriptome, from the adult brain to the human brain, and from the adult brain to the developing brain as well. And the sort of output of all of this sort of mapping is that we have this mammalian brain map where we have a lot of representation where we can look at the entire transcriptome, 20,000 genes or so, across developmental age, across brain region, and across species. And this creates a lot of opportunity for us then to look for where the conservation is and where the divergence is uh, in the organization of the cortex at the level of the transcriptome, which presumably provides the code for the structure and function of the brain. Uh, the second part of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about what we're doing this decade. Uh, so we've really had a, a change of focus recently uh, since Christoph Koch joined the Institute to become our Chief Scientific Officer. And it's provided a focus for us where we're now really trying to understand information processing in the cortex and treat the cortex as a circuit, where now we can begin to try to understand the components of the circuit, the computations that these circuits uh, 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 perform, and how this gives rise to higher order features like cognition. Um, for the most part, uh, this is, my part of the talk will be on the components element, which is something which we can actually uh, tackle in human beings. 
uh, in human tissues. Um, but in the mouse, for, for doing in parallel, we're really able to go all the way from cell types through circuits all the way to behavior. Uh, and this is actually very inspiring for thinking about what we might be able to do in human tissues as well. Uh, in the last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss what we're trying to do, uh, also working with some of our UW, UW uh, colleagues uh, to work with living human tissues. So uh, the bulk of this, the talk is really going to be focused on the idea of trying to understand what it is that is distinct about the human cortex uh, using the transcriptomes as a way to, to assess this. Um, on the one hand, there's the obvious difference in scale, a uh, thousand-fold difference, more or less. Uh, but many other features of fine cortical organization at the level of cell types, the level of developmental processes have been described uh, that presumably have molecular underpinnings uh, that we should be able to get at with a rich uh, gene expression vector provided by transcriptomics. Excuse me, could you just define transcriptome? Sure. <clears throat> so the, the transcriptome is the complete set of transcripts that are made uh, from DNA into RNA. Uh, this term is used very broadly to be all possible transcripts. It's also used in a topical way to say this is the set of transcripts which is used by a particular brain region at a particular stage or a particular cell type or a particular cell. So, but it's, the, it's intended to capture the entire set of transcripts uh, in that division. Okay, so uh, as was already mentioned in the introduction, uh, this is not a purely academic exercise here. There's a real reason for wanting to study the human, uh, and that is, I think, the over-reliance on the mouse model and the lack of success using that model. Uh, there are many, many examples where, although the mouse is an exceptional model for understanding basic biology, it has not proved to be such an exceptional model for preclinical uh, design in drug therapies. Um, this is uh, just a few examples here. Uh, I think the brain is probably worse in cancer. It's, it's sort of cited that less than 8% of, of mouse preclinical work goes to, to uh, clinic. Uh, it's substantially worse in the brain. So I think that uh, it's not only sort of of interest to ourselves, but also a necessity that we begin to understand how well our models actually replicate the real system and where possible to try to do studies in human tissues themselves. Okay, so um, I wanted to, to give, to start off by, by sort of giving an idea of what it is that we're actually trying to capture with transcriptomics. For the large part, uh, the approaches have been limited by technology. The technologies of either being able to look at gene expression one gene at a time at scale, or the tools of omics to be able to look at many, many genes at the same time. But uh, traditionally, these have been limited by the amount of material that you need to put into them. So originally, this is very large amounts of material, whole brain, getting to smaller regions of the brain. We've sort of pushed the limits here dramatically on trying to get down to individual cytoarchitectonic partitions of the brain. And now the field, of course, has, has moved very rapidly into the field of single cell transcriptomics, uh, where you're actually at a much closer level to uh, structure function relationships. Um, however, this is a sort of a historical view, so I'll give you an idea of what we have done over the years. Um, so um, the, the idea is that we would like to capture the specificity of gene expression within different regions of the brain, aerial specificity, within different layers of the cortex, the laminar specificity. Laminar specificity really is a proxy for cell types. Uh, you have different excitatory neuron types segregated in different layers. Other cell types are not segregated by layers, so that, uh, that sort of sampling strategy would not capture those. Um, but the goal would be, ideally, to get to the level of the specificity of types so that you can get a, a real idea of which cell types are expressing which gene. From a developmental perspective, things are much more complex. In order to try to capture developmental specificity, you have to actually track the uh, cellular makeup and the developmental state across time. And in this case, uh, we've tried to marry getting both the sort of laminar specificity that, to be able to selectively isolate progenitor cells or to selectively isolate different types of uh, post-mitotic neurons and do it at times which are matched to major developmental epochs 
so that we can relate those to the processes that are ongoing. So in order to approach these, uh, our primary approach has been to scale up methodologies that are very robust. Um, when we began doing the mouse atlas at the very beginning, the approach was to take the technique of in situ hybridization, <coughs> standardize this technique so that it could be done robotically, robustly, repeatedly, uh, day in, day out, to be able to look at 20,000 transcripts over uh, the entire mouse brain. Mouse brain is conveniently small, so this is actually feasible, albeit uh, one million brain sections later. Uh, so this is a very large scale effort to try to do this comprehensive mapping and then an informatics effort to, to uh, quantify this. In contrast, as we started to step up to the human brain, this was really not going to be feasible. You don't have access to thousands of, of neurotypical brains. Um, the technique doesn't work very well on a section that's so large. Um, so we had to take a different approach, and that is one of sampling and using the tools of omics at the time, microarrays, more recently, RNA sequencing. <clears throat> in this case, the goal is to sample in a meaningful way across different partitions of the brain, isolating either by macro dissection or by a technique called laser micro dissection, where you can take a histological section, lightly stain, and carve out with a laser a piece that is corresponding to a nucleus or to a layer, for example, and selectively isolate RNA from that to then profile and put on a microarray to get a quantitative readout. So one is sort of brute force, the other is a bit more sort of uh, intelligently chosen, um, massively parallel processing. We have sort of explored this space exhaustively, actually. We, uh, we've taken certain strategies of sort of coarse sampling, um, where we try to get a developmental survey, but only in a few regions. We've taken the approach of doing fine sampling, where we take, for example, in the developing prenatal brain, uh, take a very small number of specimens and go at very fine detail using this technique of laser micro dissection to isolate individual partitions. Um, or in the non-human primate, where we actually have the luxury of being able to do a carefully controlled study, uh, we've tried to combine these two things, where we get both a good time series of replicates as well as this high anatomical specificity. The other side of the equation is the degree of transcriptome coverage that you're trying to do. Um, with in situ hybridization or with microarrays, this is a gene level coverage. With sequencing, on the other hand, this covers the whole transcriptome, genes, non-coding entities, uh, splice variants. You get much, much more information, uh, but at a much higher cost as well. So uh, to begin sort of illustrating this, I, I'll use the adult human brain uh, atlas that we generated as, a, as an example of the sort of coarser approach. Uh, in this case, we took individual whole brains, uh, which we um, first did an MR on, then slabbed and froze, partitioned these onto, uh, into pieces that could be put onto two by three inch microscope slides, and then either macro dissected out regions of the cortex corresponding to uh, gyro locations, or used laser macro dissection to isolate individual partitions, nuclei that could be identified histochemically. Yeah, so the, the, cutoff, the cutoff ended up being um, about 24 hours, but the empirical test on whether this, uh, this would pass our QC was uh, RNA quality, and um, we had many exclusionary criteria as well to try to make this as neurotypical as possible. In the end, this is an enormous effort per brain, and so it was an N of six total for the, for the whole project, but uh, about a thousand brain regions for each of those brains. Um, so the, the output of this is you have a map. We now have 20,000 genes quantitatively measured across a thousand regions of the human brain. And uh, as anticipated, we see uh, very regionalized expression for things that we anticipate being regionalized, uh, such as the uh, dopamine synthetic pathways, which are regionalized in particular brainstem regions. Um, and um, this is just an illustration with a small set of genes of what we have now. We have this quantitative matrix of, of 1,000 times 20,000, uh, which we can begin to analyze. And it turns out that uh, this really illustrates well how different gene expression is in different parts of the brain. 
So what you're seeing on this slide here is a, a uh, cross correlogram where we're looking at um, expression that is, uh, that is differential between each of those thousand regions. Red is high. So you can see that there's enormous amounts of differential gene expression between different parts of the brain um, across most of the uh, subcortical regions. There are a few regions where we see relatively homogeneous uh, patterning, including the cerebellum, where we've just sampled across the cerebellum and it has a very repeating architecture. This is perhaps not surprising. Uh, as well as the neocortex. So the neocortex up here in the, uh, in the upper left, you can see it's largely blue, which means there's not much differential expression between regions at this sort of area level, with a few exceptions. The primary sensory areas in particular, primary visual cortex, uh, is quite distinct from others, both uh, cytoarchitectonically as well as uh, from the transcriptome, it turns out. This is not to say that there's no variation across the cortex. And um, one of the more interesting things I think that we found is, is that the similarity across the transcriptome as a whole is highly related to spatial proximity. So a, a clever technique that, uh, th that works in many areas that works extremely well with this transcriptome data is simply principal component analysis. Uh, you can do a dimensionality reduction and get to a level where uh, you can plot these samples on the basis of their overall similarity across the whole transcriptome. And when we first plotted this, it was quite obvious that the clustering of samples by their transcriptome similarity mirrored the, top, the topography of their spatial relationship as well. Uh, so you can see here colored in red are all of the samples from the frontal cortex, from the temporal cortex, parietal cortex, occipital cortex. These are actually not only clustering by lobe, but within lobe, and the lobes are in the right locations. And you can actually plot this out. There's a relationship uh, nearly linear between the transcriptome similarity across all 20,000 genes and how spatially uh, proximal they are. The map is a little skewed. So areas like visual cortex, which I, po I pointed out, uh, is quite distinct by other measures, uh, is sort of skewed off in the corner here. Uh, but uh, this actually illustrates two things. The, the first is that, uh, in my mind, this similarity by proximity is a reflection of ontogeny, of development that these regions were uh, derived from progenitors which were proximal in the first place. Uh, that's actually the main point. Um, okay. Can, can I yep. just, so uh, each sample would be a mix of different cell types, right? You'd have microglial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, uh, maybe endothelial cells, inhibitory neurons, excitatory neurons. Is that you're precisely correct. This this first one that I'm showing you is is a very coarse, a very coarse sort of tip of the iceberg analysis. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, in the spirit of sort of introducing you to the tools of the trade, another another very effective method for sort of looking for patterning in these data sets. Uh, is to use network biology. In, in particular, there's a method developed by Steve Horvath uh, and Dan Geschwind at UCLA, uh, which is called Weighted Gene Co-Expression Network Analysis. And basically, the idea is to look for genes that have very similar patterns uh, and group them by their topology. And what this allows you to do is to take a very unbiased look at this and say, what are the genes that are most coherent in this data set that are behaving uh, similarly? And something quite fundamental comes from this type of analysis, um, which is that the most dominant co-expression patterns relate to cell types which are embedded in this data set. So you sort of cued, cued me on this, that, that although it wasn't sampled at that level, because the, the proportion of these cells varies slightly across the different regions, the genes expressed in them also co-vary. And so this comes out as sort of a dominant sort of phenotype. So, so for example, um, there are individual modules that relate to choroid plexus, to microglia, to astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and different kinds of neurons as well. It sort of comes very naturally um, out of this data, um, which I think in the long run suggests that we should be aiming towards 
actually profiling those at the level that level in the first place. Um, on the developmental axis, uh, this is substantially more complicated, um, but the goal was really to try to capture um, both the spatial and temporal uh, patterning of the developing cortex. So this was done. Uh, the example I'm using to illustrate this was done in the non-human primate, um, where we have picked time points that correspond to the peak periods of neurogenesis for the different layers of the cortex, um, and then major developmental periods postnatally from the neonate to the infant, juvenile, and postpubertal adult. And in each time point, what we've attempted to do is to capture the different cell populations that are present taking advantage of the fact that these are sort of already segregated for us. This is a laminar structure across all of development. So that allows us then to see this histologically. We can then isolate this using laser microdissection. And so what this allows us to do then is to isolate every site of architectonically definable area over time so that we can see how the cells in each of those areas um, matures. And so what you can see is that early on, this is E40, uh, that this is essentially a proliferative zone. You have a ventricular zone, early parts of the subventricular zone, the cortical plate is very minor. Over time, the progenitor pool expands dramatically. Uh, in particular, you get the expansion of the subventricular zone, this so-called outer subventricular zone, which is not found in mass. Um, and then this progenitor pool collapses. At the same time, you're starting to generate the postmitotic neurons, which migrate up to form the cortical plate. The cortical plate expands, expands the layers, become distinct, and then ultimately this ends up occupying the entirety of the cortical plate. So we're able to look at progenitors as they're changing over time and as they're giving rise to different kinds of cells. We're able to look at the postmitotic cells as they're generated and as they mature over time as well. Very rich data set. Uh, this seems to capture the spatio-temporal dynamics that we would anticipate capturing. So for example, uh, cortical progenitors are found only in the germinal zones. Uh, intermediate progenitors are found predominantly in the subventricular zone, so they move out of the ventricular zone. Uh, these cells then migrate out, they start to express uh, neurons, uh, genes like double cortin, and then as the neurons mature, they start to turn on a much larger cohort of neuron-associated genes related with uh, ion homeostasis and neurotransmission. At slightly later times, uh, we're now capturing the um, generation of astrocytes. So in the, at E120, we start to pick up astrocyte genes in the germinal zones and then subsequently uh, enriched in layer one and in the white matter. Um, and oligodendrocytes uh, come even later. This happens, we pick it up postnatally. So this, this uh, anatomical isolation seems to really capture the cellular diversity uh, very well and gets uh, an enrichment for the genes expressed in the cell populations. So the interesting thing about this, and now I'm showing you the exact same thing, but this is in a developing human, is that the genes quickly tell you who's in this population and what state they're in. So on the one hand, we can, again, look at sort of the principal components and look for the major axes of variation. This turns out to be germinal versus postmitotic. This is maybe not a giant surprise. Uh, secondary axis is rostropodal axis uh, across the cortex. But if you look at the individual layers, you can look for genes enriched in them and then ask, are genes associated with different cell populations or different gene ontology terms enriched in each of these? You see immediately that the germinal zones are, have a whopping signature of mitosis. The cells that have migrated out, the earliest generated cells are the subplate neurons. They already look like neurons. They're expressing neuronal markers, they're expressing ion channels associated with synaptic transmission. You go to the next stage, the inner part of the cortical plate. They're only starting to look like neurons. They still have hallmarks of axonogenesis. They're forming connections. And then the outer part of the cortical plate, these are neurons, 2B neurons, which have just migrated there. They don't even look like neurons yet. They just look like mitotically active cells. So they're still sort of acquiring their phenotype as they're migrating out. So you can actually see at one snapshot the whole temporal progression of, of sort of becoming a neuron. And there are many other, other details I could go into if you're interested. So um, I, in the spirit of sort of 
illustrating where most of the variation is coming from in these data sets. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time here as well. Um, this same sort of trick of doing uh, dimensionality reduction to look where most of the variation is extremely effective here if you begin to break the data set down into smaller and smaller parts. So for example, the, if you put all of the samples together, the big difference is prenatal versus postnatal. If you look at only the prenatal samples, you get um, variation by age in one dimension and by layer in the other. And an interesting subpoint here is that the, uh, the layers are in anatomical order. So you're most closely related to uh, essentially your sibling again. Very little variation is actually in the post-mitotic neurons. But if you take that sample set alone and do the same thing with them, now you see that there is pattern, but less but more subtle uh, variation across these, such that the cells from the different layers are similar to one another by proximity again. So the layers you can see here are grouping by anatomical order through three, four, five, six, just like in the cortex itself, uh, as well as across age. So, uh, so although it's it's sort of an interesting thing that that when you look at any given gene. Every gene is sort of doing its own thing. But when you look at the global uh, features of this, it's actually highly ordered. OK, so uh, now in terms of dynamics, we can begin to ask questions about uh, where the dynamics are happening. Um, one way of doing this is to take your expression level and turn it into a rate of change. And then you can look at uh, where most of the genes or the highest rates of change are. Uh, this is actually a technique that was uh, that was used quite fruitfully on a transcriptome analysis of human prefrontal cortex by Joel Kleinman and his colleagues. And what they found was that most of the dynamics were prenatal. There was a short postnatal phase where things were still uh, very dynamic. And then very quickly, they sort of plateau uh, to very low rates of change. Um, they actually had age samples. They start to see more, more variation in age uh, specimens. So we can do the same thing except that now we've got a better time course and we've got uh, each layer independently. What they found turns out to be true here as well. Uh, if you look at the, um, the median rate of change, this is expressed as doublings or halvings per year, uh, you can see that every, every single layer has a high rate of change prenatally and tapers off postnatally. In fact, this is on a log scale. If I plotted it the way that they did, uh, by three months of age, there would be almost no change. So uh, if you plot it on, on a log scale, you can see that this change is continuing out into young adulthood. These drop off, by the way, because the progenitor pools are no longer there. So it's actually quite interesting. From the, from the gross profiling, I would have predicted that a lot of this difference, a lot of the, the rate of change that they saw was because their progenitors early and the progenitors disappeared. That turned out not to be the case. It turns out that every one of these cell populations is actually changing their profile quite substantially over time uh, and eventually plateauing. The complicated thing, which I don't have a good representation for, is that the genes that are being, the genes that are changing in each layer over time only partially overlap. So you actually have a different set of genes in each one of these populations, which is changing over time. So it's not unexpectedly a bit complex. Um, two last features uh, that I think are worth mentioning. We're not finding much evidence for spikes of gene expression. Most genes tend to take a sort of slow trajectory uh, rather than turning on and turning off again. Uh, we've looked very hard to try to find genes that had spikes at particular time points, and it just doesn't seem to work that way. Uh, here's one, one representation of this looking just at the postnatal samples to see whether we could find evidence for a set of genes that was enriched during juvenile development, for example. Using the same sort of weighted uh, co-expression network analysis, the modules that come out bear no resemblance to that. They're either high early and decrease, or low early and increase. And most of that change is in the first couple of months after birth. So most of this seems to be um, gradual. And then uh, finally, so it's a bit surprising to me. Um, we're very interested in the emergence of cellular identity 
So in the adults, we spend a lot of time trying to find molecular signatures of different cell types. And we sort of had assumed that a fair amount of this comes right out of the gate. The cell differentiates. It might look like, uh, look like it will uh, much later in development. That turns out not to be the case. Most, each of these cells, by which I mean a layer which has multiple cell types, is distinct from its neighbors early, and it's distinct from its neighbors late. The genes that make it distinct are almost entirely different early and late. So this is represented on the left here of the conservation of highly selective genes within the different layers. And prenatally, um, almost none of the genes that are expressed postnatally are already selected for those populations. So this adult identity is something which, which um, happens gradually, but it happens surprisingly late. It happens quite postnatally. The same turns out to be true for aerial specificity. This is not something which comes, which is out of the gate. There actually are two periods of time in which you get big differences between cortical areas. One is prenatal, and this turns out actually to represent a temporal gradient in neurogenesis. The, there's almost a month difference in what neurons are being generated at a particular point in time in the front and the back of the cortex in, in a primate. The later represents true sort of mature aerial signatures. So this actually really ramps up in uh, after one year of age, so that was a, a bit surprising. Okay, so um, so the reason I wanted uh, to sort of lay these these sort of broad strokes is to is to is to give you an idea of sort of the general lay of the land of where most of the variation is, so that we can now start asking: Are the details actually conserved across species? And the things that I've told you so far, I think you would find to be true in a mouse, a monkey, or a man. Uh, as sort of generalities. So to sum these up, first of all, the vast majority of the genes are expressed in most structures. Um, about In the adult, we found about 85% of genes are actually expressed. Um, in development, it's even higher, probably because we have these mitotic cells that express a different cohort of genes. It's almost 95%. And as I've sort of alluded to, basically everything changes over development. I suppose at some level this must be true, but you would think that there is a substantial cohort of sort of housekeeping genes that are on throughout. Very close to 100% of genes change uh, by twofold, which in gene expression space is pretty significant uh, over development. These tend to be gradual. Uh, this mature state emerges, early, uh, emerges late. And as I've shown you already, uh, these sort of major axes include age or developmental state. Uh, the layer, area, and very importantly, I think the cell type as well. Could you, maybe I'm missing this, but would you tell me again what you mean by the gene changing? Do you just mean on or off, or something more than that? No, I mean a quantitative difference over age. So we have a we have a quantitative readout for each of these each of these regions over time, and so we can we can ask: Are we seeing significant changes across age at a certain level, significant threshold and level. So it's a quantitative difference, it's not a binary difference. Okay, so um, so the, the I'm going to spend the next part of this talk beginning now to look for uh, conservation and divergence uh, within these data sets. So we've tried to do this in a variety of ways. The, the first way we've done it is a simple comparison where we have like data. Uh, we've had in situ hybridization data, which gives you the cellular resolution patterning for uh, the mouse. We've done this for about a thousand genes in the human cortex as well. And so we can uh, ask questions about to what extent this cellular patterning is conserved across species. And uh, you know, sort of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, you can see from the mouse data that there are many highly selective genes for different cell populations, which is uh, not captured by doing a, a gross dissection. So we've done a lot of these comparisons. And um, one of the things that has come out of this is that there are a lot of changes, a lot of differences across species. Um, here's a particularly robust example that I'd like to show. This is a pre-pro opioid called prodynorphin that in the mouse is expressed selectively in a set of GABAergic interneurons, and the human and the non-human primate 
is expressed in very select subsets of excitatory cells in different layers of the cortex. Um, so these are, this gene is certain to be having different effects on circuits uh, in these different, two different species. This turns out not to be rare. So um, here are a whole set of examples where we had actually uh, all three species that we could compare. And indeed, there are a number of these genes which are quite well preserved in terms of their laminar specificity. But there are a lot that are not. In addition to this example I just showed, there are others where you'll have a shift in layers from one layer to another layer. You have others where it will be in multiple layers in one species, and then it drops off or gains a layer in the other species. So these things seem to be regulated at the level of cell types within specific uh, layers of the cortex uh, or in different uh, types like inhibitory neurons. Uh, and if, you, if we look sort of more broadly, it turns out that about 25, or 25 to 30 percent of the genes that we looked at, this is about a thousand genes, showed some significant detectable difference in either uh, the distribution at the cellular level or the relative um, expression across, uh, across different regions of the cortex. So to me, that's actually a very large number. I was not expecting to see quite such a large number. Um, and it suggests that, uh, that we really need to pay attention to these, and uh, particularly these genes that have uh, very robust patterning seem to be labile and able to change quite a bit over species. It has turned out to be far more difficult to discover differences between uh, monkey and human. Uh, in fact, the, really the sole example that I have is in the hippocampus here, uh, where we have uh, calbindin, which is expressed in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, as well as the CA field of the hippocampus. This is also true in macaque. In human, it's only in the dentate and not in CA1. So it's the same general idea of regulation at the level of cell types. Um, but it's been quite challenging to, to find these differences, and in general, uh, we actually have some data that suggests that the frequency with which we see patterning differences relates to evolutionary distance, as you might expect. Okay, um, the, the other really major area that we see differences is at the level of cortical specializations. So, in particular, primary visual cortex has a very distinct cytoarchitecture uh, in primates. Uh, you can see this at a distance. And there are many genes that are quite selective for this. Uh, here is a gene called synaptotagmin 6, which is incredibly selective for primary visual cortex, and just in one particular cell population in layer 6 of primary visual cortex. Um, here in the macaque, you can see the same patterning uh, just in V1 in layer 6. If you look at mouse, which doesn't have a specialized um, uh, primary visual cortex, it is actually in the same layer, but it is not at all specialized in visual cortex. So uh, this turns out to be a generality, uh, but not something particularly human-specific. Uh, it relates to functional specialization. If you look in the mouse, there are many, many genes that are highly selective for barrel cortex that you don't see in somatosensory cortex of, of human. Um, one thing that, it, that was uh, a bit surprising is that uh, we find many genes that have quite substantially changed their patterning and certain cell types where this happens very frequently. So um, in this particular uh, case, what we try to do is to take these gene expression modules that relate to cell types. We have modules that are expressed in, um, in the cortex. We have modules expressed in the striatum, cerebellum, modules expressed in different kinds of glia. And we have data in both species. We can ask, are these genes that are co-expressed in human also co-expressed in mouse. And uh, for the most part, uh, they tend to be reasonably well conserved. You can see the overlap between these modules. But in, in every case, we can find genes that have radically different patterns. So for example, here is sort of a forebrain neuronal patterning in mouse um, that's similar to the human, and the occasional gene that is only cerebellum expressed. So it's fundamentally shifted its expression pattern. Here's an example for a strain a module becomes cerebellum express, or one that is um, more sort of gabergic cells that now becomes thalamic. But the big thing is, you can see on this plot on the um, bottom left here, is that some modules are ex exceptionally poorly preserved. And in particular, 
this is a module associated with oligodendrocytes here, where some genes are highly conserved, but many are not. So this is actually something which has been observed in other omic studies as well, that um, there may be a particularly poor concordance in certain kinds of glia as opposed to the neurons. Um, finally, uh, we've also tried to look to see uh, whether developmental trajectories are conserved and whether we can find uh, evidence of genes that have fundamentally shifted their developmental trajectories. Uh, in this case, we've taken advantage of, of uh, the rhesus data, the human data, and available rat data uh, from the same regions across the developmental survey. And we can ask the question, of, are there developmental trajectories conserved or not? And uh, the bottom line is that uh, there's actually reasonably good conservation. In this case, 62% uh, of the genes were going in the same direction. 16%, um, on the other hand, were different between mouse, uh, I should say, uh, rodents and primates. And 6% actually uh, had a human-specific pattern. Here you can see two examples where um, in the uh, human, for example, LIN7A is going down across development, and in both in macaque and in rat, it's going up. So we have some things which have just really fundamentally shifted their patterns. What exactly this means functionally, I think remains to be seen. Um, but the point really is that there are many differences uh, between species that, um, that are likely to lead to functional consequences. OK, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk uh, on our future directions here. So um, we've really begun to shift gears a bit from a pure transcriptomic kind of approach uh, to much more of a functional approach in trying to understand cell types and circuits. And in particular, my focus in this uh, area is to try to understand how well conserved different features of cortical cell types and circuits are across species and where there might be species differences uh, that we could detect across many modalities. The uh, sort of basic idea is to try to take this scale-up approach that we've been quite successful with in the gene expression space and apply it to many other features of cells so that we can try to capture the different, different uh, phenotypic modalities of cells at scale to be able to build a systematic quantitative taxonomy of types. Among these things are the transcriptome, the physiological intrinsic membrane properties, the morphology of these cells, which predicts connectivity. In the mouse, we're also trying to capture the target specificity that I have yet to find a way that we might actually do this in, in human tissues. Um, but the idea is, is to really build a statistical understanding and a model of these different cell types, and ultimately a wiring diagram of how they uh, fit together into a, a functional circuit that we could compare across species. This is not something that is sort of the first time this has been done. Uh, there have been many attempts to try to classify different kinds of neuron types, uh, primarily in the mouse. Uh, prominent among these are classifications of GABAergic interneurons from Gordon Shell, or uh, many different cell types uh, from Henry Markham's group. Uh, using morphology, using uh, electrophysiology, and to some degree marker expression. Um, so, so why would we be able to, uh, to do this differently? Well, we have the ability to do these things in a very standardized fashion at scale, in a way that simply isn't possible in an academic lab. So we've been in a retooling process where we're trying to develop a new suite of technologies that's amenable for working on human tissues that allow us to do these quantitative analyses at the level of individual cells. This includes single cell RNA sequencing to get the transcriptomes of individual cells. It includes quantitative morphological analysis. It includes very standardized electrophysiology, uh, and perhaps also looking at the, uh, the synapse makeup of these. But the idea that if we could generate large-scale data sets, we can generate a quantitative taxonomy from this where we really have a good statistical description of the different components that we can compare this across species. Um, I'm going to go through each of these just very briefly. Um, as I've alluded to a number of times, I think the, the field as a whole has recognized that 
transcriptome analysis should be done at the level of individual cells or cell types. There's a virtual revolution going on right now where you can't pick up a new uh, 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 version of science without another paper about single cell analysis. Um, the technology has, has really progressed rapidly. There were two papers out this week on a new method called DropSeq, which allows you to isolate individual cells in small little droplets, the purpose of which is to be able to allow you to miniaturize and reduce the volumes and thus the cost necessary and increase the throughput. And this method was applied to 40,000 cells in the retina. And on the basis of this, uh, they were able to classify very nearly these number of cell types that uh, have been described by many other means, including about 20 different types, types of amacrine cells. Uh, so this area is simply exploding. Um, at the same time, uh, you can even push the limits down to looking at single nuclei, uh, which turns out to be actually quite important because uh, it's not very easy to isolate whole cells from human tissues. So we've been working on this area uh, quite a lot and had a lot of progress already in the mouse arena. In the mouse, this is sort of shooting fish in a barrel. You can uh, have Cree lines that have very selective cell populations labeled. You can uh, take a slice of cortex, dissociate it by protease and trituration, isolate the fluorescent cells by fact sorting, uh, and then apply sequencing to these. And really quite readily, different cell classes pop out of this. You're able to uh, cluster the cells based on their transcriptome profile. Uh, and we're already able to discriminate uh, dozens of types of cortical neurons on the basis uh, of these transcriptomes. A slightly side note that comes out of this is that although the Cree lines are very specific, they're not purely specific, and each one of these lines is actually a slight mixture of cell populations. Uh, so although it's a dramatic enrichment, uh, it's not sort of uh, a pure cell type that is being looked at. Uh, we do. So, the no. So some of this, um, we also did some of the unlabeled population, and so out of that came the uh, came. So, that's right. So, so imagine you have a, a in a single cell. Typically, this is more like five to ten thousand genes. But you have, a, let's say, a ten thousand gene quantitative vector that you can use as the basis of of clustering, and uh, so the cell populations very readily cluster from one another. And so there, there's a new sort of suite of analytical tools that's ongoing with this as well, which has to deal with the noisiness within these data. Um, but um, especially things like microglia or oligodendrocytes or oligodendrocyte precursor cells, they, they're very distinct. They pop out very easily. Um, we're also trying to develop methods for being able to uh, get large numbers of filled neurons so that we can do quantitative anatomy and try to understand what the salient features of these cells are in a very uh, quantitative manner. Uh, the, the method that we're approaching at the moment for this is, uh, is to take uh, a method called, uh, that uses lucifer yellow filling in lightly fixed tissues. This is amenable to uh, short PMI postmortem tissues. You can go in and poke individual cells and fill them. You get these beautiful fills. Uh, you can see here on the bottom left, just marching across and filling a bunch of cells. Uh, so we can uh, get lots of cells simultaneously. And then uh, this is actually a lot of data. And so we're trying to develop uh, the imaging uh, to be able to do sort of a smart imaging where you don't capture everything, but you only capture where the signal is uh, so that we can actually get this in a digitized format. So the last, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is in some ways, I think the most exciting. And this is uh, that we've begun to work with uh, several of our local colleagues here to try to uh, do functional studies in living brain slices. Um, this is sort of based on the precedent of Gabor Tomasz and Heid Mamsfelder, uh, who for some time now have been taking neurosurgical resections, doing vibratome sectioning, and then doing patch clamp electrophysiology, either single or paired. And I think they've demonstrated very nicely that this is routinely feasible in these neurosurgical tissues, uh, despite being from pathological sources, um, and starting to find uh, what they believe are uh, some uh, differences between rodent and human. So we've now begun a program trying to do this ourselves. And uh, we have the 
I'm happy to say, enthusiastic support of many of our local colleagues here, in particular starting with Jeff Ogeman. Um, Andrew Coe is now on board, and hopefully Dan Silvergeld, um, as well as several um, colleagues at Swedish Medical Center, Reiner Gwynn and Charles Cobbs, all of whom uh, have been supplying to us uh, pieces of tissue that are resected in the process of doing a treatment for epilepsy or, or the removal of a tumor. Typically, uh, what this looks like for epilepsy is a piece of middle temporal gyrus. Uh, for tumor, it can be more, uh, more variable. Uh, we get this, uh, say, centimeter cube of tissue. We're able to vibratome it in a way that preserves all the layers of the cortex. And uh, it turns out that these slices are actually very viable. A mouse slice might survive for six or eight hours. These human slices will survive without culturing for two to three days. And we're able to keep them alive for weeks in culture. So we're, I guess we're built to last. Uh, there's something fundamentally different about the longevity of these uh, slices in our favor. So uh, what we're trying to do with this then is to standardize the approach of doing electrophysiology, tax clamp electrophysiology to get the intrinsic membrane properties um, of individual neurons coupled with filling the cells and getting their morphology. And based on this success, we have a lot of other possibilities of things we can do as well. I sort of aspire to develop a model system that's ourselves that has some of the benefits that a mouse does now. With a mouse, the ability to use transgenics and molecular genetic tools has really revolutionized what one can do in a slice. Uh, we also aspire to do some of these things by doing molecular genetic manipulation uh, of these acute slices that we're able to keep alive long enough to do uh, viral infections. Uh, this is, by the way, the work of Jonathan Ting, a very, a very talented physiologist in my group. So the approach uh, is that we have developed a uh, suite of, um, or a battery of current pulses that allows us to um, very routinely assay the intrinsic membrane properties of these cells. Uh, these include uh, ramps, include steps, and include noise stimuli, during which the cell is being filled by biocytin. Um, unlike a normal lab, uh, we now have a, a core set up to do this. We have a team of five physiologists who every day record from mouse, and when human tissue uh, is available, they'll be recording from human tissue to try to build a big data set uh, from these samples. And so far, this is uh, working quite well. Uh, we're able to um, look at these slices, identify cells using DIC optics, and patch onto various types of cells. Here are some examples of pyramidal neurons in layer 2, 3, and 5, uh, as well as fast spiking basket cells. At the end of this, we fill it with biocytin. We're able then to uh, image and reconstruct these cells. And then uh, we have a modeling team who are creating biophysical models of these uh, to try to mirror their properties so that these can be built into circuit models. In addition, um, it turns out that perhaps because of the longevity of the slices, or perhaps because they're bigger, it's actually easier to do pair recordings in human slices than in, uh, in mouse slices. So we're beginning to look at circuit connectivity where we can do paired or quad recordings to look at uh, the probability of connectivity between different kinds of cells that we can identify as well. And uh, even occasionally, we perhaps have the opportunity to try to characterize cells which have been sort of called out as uh, potentially human enriched, such as these von Economo cells. Uh, we have actually our first potential von Economo cell. This is in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. as this elongated morphology with the um, axon coming out at a red angle. Uh, so I think this may be the first patched human von Economo cell, if in fact this is a von Economo cell. Um, so there's a lot of room for discovery here uh, using these tissues. So let me just end. Um, with where I think a lot of the future of this is. And this is moving beyond the needle in the haystack approach. So although we're scaling this up, this is still fundamentally the techniques that have been used for uh, the last 30 or 40 years. Whereas in the mouse, you have this ability to do targeting of specific cell populations. So what we're trying to develop now are fast viruses, which will allow us to target and apply molecular genetic tools to these human cortical slices. Um, the sort of basics are already working pretty well. We're able to take either AAVs or uh, HSVs, 
expressing fluorophores and express them in these slices, these acute slices, and within one to three days we can get very brightly labeled cells. These are not yet targeting particular populations, but this is feasible to do. Um, after this period of time, these cells are still healthy. You can record from them, they're um, still firing with relatively normal properties. And um, we've now actually begun to try to use other molecular genetic tools. To my knowledge, this is the very first channel rhodopsin ever in a human cortical slice here, where we've used an HSD to introduce channel rhodopsin so that we can stimulate the cells with blue light. Uh, here are two examples of cells of fast spiking interneuron and pyramidal neuron, where in the middle here, the blue bar indicates turning on the light. You can induce spiking. It's characteristic of those cells. It's very similar quantitatively to what you can do with the current pulse. So if we can get cellular specificity here as well, we have a model system which is very similar to uh, what one can do in a mouse. We can really begin to probe uh, differences in, in circuit connectivity uh, in humans compared to mouse. And I think uh, with that, I'm going to end. Uh, there are many people to thank for this. The atlasing work is really the work of, of literally hundreds of people. Um, it's a very much a team effort that we have uh, specialists in many different areas, both in sort of the production arm and the research arm uh, that are involved in these. Uh, I would particularly like to thank our local colleagues who have helped to get the work I was talking about at the end off the ground, in particular Jeff Ogeman, Andrew Coe, uh, Dirk Keen, and Rich Allen Bogan, as well as Ryder Glenn and Charles Collins from Swedish Hospital. Thank you. So I guess you view this as the whole like pulse tensor thing, right? So including all your non-coding elements and everything. That's correct. So So uh, I'm curious if yeah, you can view this like we just see a significant difference between this this great thing we talked about in the axon. That's a great question. So well I'm not sure that's it's quite the axon, but it's ideally but you would perfectly recite the question before you give an answer because of our inability to get the audience exactly on tape. <coughs> My apologies. Uh, the question was, is there a way in which we could look at just those uh, actively transcribed regions, I believe, that you refer to them as the exome? Those that are translated. Uh, trans actually translated, I'm sorry. So um, so there, there is a method in mouse which is used that effectively does this. This is uh, called the trap method, which is a, a basically you're pulling down tagged ribosomes with whatever RNAs are complex with them. And this is used routinely. Uh, Nat Hines developed this method. It's used routinely with, with mice, mostly as a way of being able to circumvent the need to isolate those cells. You can selectively label them, do a pull-down assay, and get just whatever's being uh, translated in those cells. Um, it wasn't really designed to get only the translated ones, but that's effectively what it does. So if there are other ones that are not part of the polyribosomes, they're not pulled down with this. Um, in principle, this could be done with um, human as well, if you were to use some some tag to pull down the polyribosomes uh, in some population, but but in practice, because we don't have the benefit of the transgenics, uh, we're not able to do that. I have a so you said that the expression of the gene is usually smooth but not peaked, right? But there are certain phenomena that always there's been already tried something for tight Russell's theory in expression, which is like, for instance, the triggering of specific critical period of development associated with toxicity, degradation, or something like that. Um, so, so what? Uh, those are very critical periods that are very important for developing and pathology and so on. So, what what can this approach provide towards that that, that goal? Is any insight coming from this approach? So, the the question is. Um, since we don't see evidence of uh, peaks of expression, very sharp peaks of expression 
what can we learn about um, critical period type of events where there is a discrete a discrete period in which the onset and then the onset of the finish of the period. Right. Um, so this is actually a bit of a mystery. Um, you know, many genes that are associated with uh, with plasticity uh, turn on, but they stay on. And this is something that perhaps I didn't emphasize, although we don't see too much in the way of, of these peaks, we see lots of things turn on at different times and stay on. And uh, I think perhaps that um, somehow embedded in this machinery by these different things which are, which are turning on and perhaps some other things which are turning off, you somehow bracket it, but it's, it doesn't turn out to be a major feature which pops out of the data. Um, so I, I should say that I was very much trying to generalize on some ways of making sense of this data when there's an awful lot going on at the level of individual genes. It could be that the basis for shutting off a critical period doesn't require a lot of genes. Uh, you know, what we're sort of seeing, are, I think, with most of what I showed you are sort of the real generalities in the, in the tips of the icebergs, but, um, but I was honestly surprised. I did my thesis work on critical period, and I don't see any evidence for you know, an onset or an offset of such a thing. And um, so it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Yes? Um, are we getting anywhere close to um, high resolution, like let's say seven Tesla magnet um, imaging that might, with some kind of a labeling mechanism, be able to image the patterns of gene expression? So the question is, are, is imaging nearing the capacity to have the resolution to look at uh, gene expression patterns with some sort of a labeling strategy? I'm afraid that this is out of my realm of expertise. Um, I don't know the answer to that. So are you, is there any value, and have you thought about, particularly <coughs> the human brain, comparing right side to left side to get some clues for something like language development? That's a great question. So uh, the question is, uh, do we have any evidence for hemispheric uh, differences in gene expression that might relate to functional differences? Um, an awful lot of effort has been put onto that particular question without much fruit, I have to say. Um, my good colleague from Yale, Nenad Sestan, who's um, doing very similar things, uh, has, has spent a lot of time on this particular question looking for left-right differences, even in areas where you might expect them to be, which is language areas. We also started our adult human brain atlasing program looking at both hemispheres with that notion in mind. And we have both been entirely unsuccessful in finding hemispheric differences. Um, it should be said that there are some caveats to that. Uh, namely, we are basically normalizing to this, a number of cells that we're looking at. So if a region is larger on one side than the other, we won't pick that up at all. We will only pick up whether there is a quantitative difference in any unit density of that area. Um, but that being said, um, not only do we not find hemispheric differences, with the exception of a few cortical areas, we also don't see uh, dramatic aerial differences, uh, except for um, you know, primary sensory areas, uh, for example. So uh, the transcriptome isn't revealing everything. It's, it's revealing certain things, and I think we're seeing where most of the variation is. The variation is, is very much at the level of, of cell types and developmental states. Um, so I don't, I don't know where that's going to reveal itself. Um, but there's a big disconnect, I think, between the sort of parcellation that is happening in the functional imaging realm as a whole and what we're able to see with this kind of method where we don't see anything like sharp boundaries or evidence for lots of partitions, much less hemispheric differences. Does it follow up that a little bit? So do you envision a time in the future, perhaps a long time off, when this kind of technology will be so straightforward and I hope that because they use the word simple, but where, where you could take a brain of a human with an unexplained disease such as autism or schizophrenia and run their whole brain through a system like this and begin to see differences with the normal. Now that's a great question. Um, the question is, uh, 
can we envision a future not too far off in the distance where this type of approach becomes so reliable that one could um, look at whole brains in disease? Um, well, I think things are rapidly moving in the in the, the direction of massively parallel analysis of large cell populations at uh, at shallow shallow depth of sequence. Uh, so I see very much in the near future the ability to expand this to look at at disease states, and I actually think that that's where we're going to find things becoming a bit more interpretable than they are at the moment. Um, on the other hand. Applying this to whole brains, I'm not sure. There, I think the latest number is 84 billion neurons in the human brain. Uh, so that's still a pretty big number uh, to do transcriptional analysis on the whole brain. Um, but I think you could do it in targeted ways uh, at the level of you know hundreds of thousands of neurons. Very soon, actually. I uh, uh, you know I I must say that uh, it's incredibly impressive. It's just a different way of thinking than an awful lot of people in the audience. We're used to having controllable systems, changing one thing, looking for one of several outcomes. Uh, that's just the way I tend to think and probably others in the audience. Uh, I do see the incredible value of being able to do that against a backdrop of so much information. Uh, that's going to be hugely helpful. Um, but. It, uh, it does leave me wondering, you know, you have to make assumptions to uh, provide all this data. There are assumptions along the way, I presume. Uh, and do you have ways of testing, you know, could we have gone off the tracks a little bit uh, by making an assumption that this is marking a glial cell without really knowing absolutely that that's the case? Yeah, so, um so I could paraphrase that very long question. Um, the, um, this, this data is very unlike what you're used to looking at in terms of sort of A-B comparison or control disease state comparison. Um, and it seems that some assumptions are maybe made from the, from the data in interpreting what these signals actually mean. Um, I think this is a reasonable, this is a reasonable question when we're trying to make statements about a gene co-expression module which represents a cell population that we didn't actually isolate in the first place. Um, it has been remarkably fruitful to take that approach for that sort of level of, of analysis where there are other data sets of purified populations of these kinds of cells to which these profiles can be compared and they compare quite favorably. Um, that being said, um, I think, I mean, the, the beauty of these data sets in some ways is that we try not to make assumptions in their data generation. And by, by simply profiling all genes, then we're not making any assumptions about what the genome space is. We are simply trying to, uh, in fact, at the single cell level, this is really very unbiased. You take a population of cells and you do whole transcriptome analysis of all of them, and then you let the data sort, of sort itself out. Uh, so in that sense, it's it's unbiased. Where the bias comes in, I think, is in the interpretation, um, and I think that just requires validation. Um, and so we've you know we've done quite a bit of validation where we take these modules of genes which putatively represent a cell population, take the hub genes from that, and go and do in situ hybridization where you can look at the cellular distribution, and they tend to to agree with what we think they should be based on the anatomical distribution then of the cellular distribution of those genes, which is quite easy to see in a histological section. Um, that being said, you know, the, the tools for interpretation are still somewhat nascent, uh, and they're very unsatisfying. So, for instance, you, do, you look at these patterns and you identify a whole suite of patterns, and then you say, well, now how will I interpret this pattern? So, the tools are gene ontology. You can go and you can say who, which is just a compilation of anybody in the community who has written a paper about some gene. Now there's a function associated with that gene, and you look for a statistical enrichment of a particular gene category. Or uh, what's becoming increasingly prevalent is to take as reference data sets purified populations for which transcriptome analysis has been done. You say, are the genes that are 
discriminatory for that population in a purified way, enriched in one of these, which would give you an idea that that, that gene module is likely to represent that. Um, but you tend to get, you know, very, very coarse things that way. You get, um, you know, oligodendrocytes. You get uh, synaptic transmission. You know, this is not, it's, it doesn't sort of get to the depth of meaning of this data where you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of genes which are, which are in this module and distinct in this cell population versus that cell population. Uh, so I, I think, but this is something which is, in the 10 years that I've been doing this, has improved dramatically. And I think that as a community effort, the annotations will get better and better so that the interpretations become more reliable and more meaningful.